Greetings, everyone. This is Gerard, editor in chief of Filipino Soul Magazine, <clears throat> aka SGIP Magazine. The stand for soldiers got intentions to believe that because everyone should be soldiering for something a dream, a goal, an idea, a trend, or something. Just look at Cebu. I want to show you a little bit of Cebu, or at least hear the sounds of it. Not too many sirens and emergency vehicles rushing through. Very peaceful. But anyway, what I wanted to talk to you about was a little bit first about the Philippines. You know, um, I'm in the G hour of the night. The G hour is when I do my work. Where I work on my magazine, work on my photographs, <coughs> or, you know, maybe catch up on some of the news. <coughs> and, um, um, sometimes I feel like I'm in the land of milk and honey. I don't like that glare right there. Let's lower this down in the mirror and the window. Oh, okay, yeah. Lighting is about everything, y'all. Always remember that. So anyway, so um, uh, I like girls. I'm the first one to admit it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I like girls. You know, you can be mad at me if you want to. You can hate me if you want to. But. I like being around girls. I always have been, ever since I was in school. When I was in, uh, went to North Carolina when I was running from the blacks, because I was black. I mean, from the North. I was a Yankee, or running from the whites because I was black, because I'm black. You know, when I learned that people can hate you for things that you have no control over, of where you were born and the color of your skin, you know. But I always seem to have found refuge amongst girls, you know, because, uh, uh, the things they say, the things they do, how they smell, you know, how soft they are to touch, how beautiful they are. Because I think all women are beautiful. There's no such thing as an ugly woman, only a lazy woman. If a woman is lazy, then yes, she can make herself look very unattractive, unattracting. But if she puts effort and pride in herself, she is very beautiful can be very beautiful. Case in point, here in the Philippines, you know, uh, being a friend to a Filipina is a, is a genuine friend, is I think a very special, and a very rare, you know, attribute when it comes to being a, a foreigner. You know, like, um, uh, <clears throat> for instance, I was sitting down one time and this girl says, you know, you know, can I touch your hair? So I said, sure. She can touch your hair. She finished touching my hair. I said, now can I touch your hair? And oh my God, do I look beautiful black hair? Oh my God, it's like where you been all my life. And it was funny because like last night, you know, I was, you know, I was sleeping, my head in the lap of a beautiful Filipino girl. <laughs> oh, I said, watch soaps. And I woke up and she had breathed. <laughs> She had braided my hair. <laughs> it was so funny because I said, "What?" I said, "No, no, finish it, finish it." <laughs> but she didn't. She had to go. <laughs> so it's one of those things. Or like when you're talking to them, you know, in the United States, if you're talking to a girl, stand back, don't get in my face. You know, as was you're so close to me, name germs, whatever. You know, it's different. You know, people are people are a lot more respectful. People are a lot more, you know, um, receptive. And having you in their space, you know, because um, they're not spoiled by the way, you know, American women have been. I'm just going to speak about American women because that's, I've been in other cultures, you know, um, you know, Latin culture, Russian culture, Nigerian culture, you know, but uh, I say American, American. And, um, you know, uh, the, you know, even using certain slang words that I know I can use that fits the situation for that situation, I won't use. You know, because I don't want to have to explain to them that it's a slang from the U.S. and, and I don't want to, you know, have that in their vocabulary. You know, I, I'd rather keep you, you know, um, it's not about being naive, it's that I like your culture the way it is. That's why I'm here. I'm here because I love your culture. I love your culture. You know, and so so being around girls is uh, is is one. You know, I, 
I doing? You know, uh, I always thought that when I came to the Philippines, that I was going to have a staff of girls working for me. All of them working nude. <laughs> now, that was my, truly my dream, being here in the Philippines, is having nothing but nude Filipina girls working around me. <laughs> Because <laughs> drive, you could make it happen in the Philippines. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, but you know, now it's you know, I, that's my staff is not most females unless I have a driver. You know, and I have one contributing writer who's a male, which is fine. You know, um, women I find to be a lot more trusting, contrary, contrary to what a lot of people. Think as far as foreigners, you can never trust a Filipino girl. Never trust all she wants is money, 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 money. True, isn't that what we want all over the world? Is money, 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 money. So what makes them any different? You know. But once you get past that, it was like me, me and uh, the girl I was with. <clears throat> you know, um, before, you know, her and I were going to strip clubs. She thought it would be unusual. Like why? Why you want to go? Sure. Why are you taking me into a strip club? Because I tried to explain to her. That you know, once you get inside and you talk to the girls, they're just girls. They're just girls working. I said, in no better way, you know, for, for you to to meet and uh, you know, it's, uh, people didn't talk to them. So we were going there and you know, uh, they to come in, come in, and I said, okay, look, if you want to drink, here's your drink. We just didn't talk, and she would end up having a conversation with them that was, I, I just said, like a fly on the wall. Because she would find out that you know, they're not that bad. They're just girls, you know, working, doing what they have to do in order to take care of their families, you know, in order to, you know, have a better life for themselves. Same thing like all over the world, you know. So, sure, they're, you know, they look, they look at or whatever that stuff, but <laughs> there's a secret about being around girls, you know. But games should be told, not sold. I mean, games should be sold, not told. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. I have to read my book, which I plan to do because I think I'm going to put down the magazine. I get one more issue after this one. And I think I'll give it a break because I do want to write a book and a screenplay. And I'm just an old man running out of time. You know, so I really want to focus on those two projects. And I'm going to put a lot of my lifelong secrets, you know, as far as being around women and dealing with women, relationships and everything. Like, for instance... The secret to having uh, a long relationship, or the secret about relationships, is that one thing that that breaks up most relationships is money. You know, either one makes too much, or you know, one doesn't make enough, or one doesn't have enough, but it's expected to pay every time they go out. And, you know, what have you, and sometimes the bills, you can't make the bills, and whatever, like this, like this, like this. That's why, whenever I like to get involved with the girl, the first thing I do is look for one that's working. One that has a job. One who is taking care of her own responsibilities in life. Why would I want to meet someone on the street, you know, who's you know, who's who's a hot mess, and I have one of those in my life. You know, I, I'm spanking her right now because she did bad, but she's being spanked by love her to death. You know, but uh, because she realizes that that I'm not just the passing foreigner. You know, I'm somebody with substance and staying power, and you need to know me because I'm willing to help you, providing you do the right thing for you. Same, you same. Know, you know, but anyway, so. <clears throat> You know, so um, uh, I I want to want to um, write that book. I was telling you a story about a girl. Okay, but anyway, so it's being around them. You know, it's it's um, I like it. I like it. I like it. Um, but I kind of lost my train of thought thinking about hot mess because hot mess is uh, you know she's she's oh yeah okay <clears throat> a girl that's working. Most of the time, whenever I have got some of my stars, let's say who I was, it was someone who was working. I sat my sights on them, and every day I knew she worked nine to five, you know. And I would go by and chisel, 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 and eventually we we get a nice com communicate, a nice rapport together, and eventually say, hey, you want to go? Hey, yeah, and and that's how it starts. 
But the thing that breaks up, as I was saying, is, is money. <clears throat> I'm going to show you something in a second, so let me finish this. <clears throat> it's money. So, when my Russian, my Ukrainian girl and I got together, I told her, look, we're going to split everything down the middle. When I go out, when we go out, you take $20, I'll take $20. You know, twenty dollars, ten dollars to pay the cover, ten dollars for a drink, and we would have a good time. You know, we dance, we drink, or whatever, like this, like this, like this. <clears throat> if we go to McDonald's and bought a Happy Meal, you know, she bought a Happy Meal one day. The next day, I bought the quarter pounders. We would write down what we spent, and then at the end of the month, we would add up what each one of us has spent. Whoever owed one or whoever paid more, you know, uh, paid the other one off and everybody spent the same amount of money. And that's the secret of, I think, of having a relationship. Because often the time the guy, might, he might have a girl who makes more than he does and every time they go out she wants him to be buying something or, or paying for the meals and he's, God damn, you, you make more than I do, why do I have to pay them more? Or the thing. <clears throat> You know, I know once with my ex and I, you know, we went to a store and there was this Filipina girl and she was with this foreigner. And she was at when they said, Oh, she said, I want this, I want this. And and, and he's like standing there and she's like, No, buy me this. And, you know, you know, and she told him, bah, 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 bah. And the sales girl, she was waiting on us, but they came and I said, No, 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 take care, take care. And so I said to her, I said, do we look like that? She said, no, you know, like that. And it was so important to me, you know, although she was working, or oh, I stopped her from working because I decided to replace her salary, <clears throat> which was fine because she was working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So what, for $120 a month, so I said, shit, it was 7,000 pesos. So I said, what? I said, I'll give you 7,000 pesos. Stay with me. Don't worry about taking care of him, which I did. <clears throat> you know, so anyway, so, uh, um, you know, uh, I did not want to walk around and every time she wanted something to have to go in my pocket and pay for it. I'm a player. That's not how I, that's how I, that's not how I do things. You know, I do things with you paying, you know, those type of things. You know. So I try to make sure that she always had money on her to pay for the taxis, to pay for this, pay for that, because I don't want to dig in my pocket. You got make sure you have money. I know what you have. When you low I give you more and we we keep it moving. And that's how we got down, you know. Now getting back to you know, um, but that's that's what I think about uh, secret about relationships is is um, financial. So if you take care of the financial aspect of the relationship, you'll be all right. And consistency. You know, you have to be consistent in a relationship. When you start a relationship, and you start a relationship, open up car doors. Like I do with my Ukrainian girl, 10 years for later, when we finally decided to go our separate ways, I said, you'll never find another person like me. I said, you know why you won't find another man like me? Because for 10 years, you never had to open up your own car door. You know, just simple. You know, just things like that. Because when, when, when people get into relationships, sure, you want to impress. Sure, you want to do. Sure, you get up and you're clean. And sure, you get up and you'll do this. And, Two months later, you come in like, what the fuck? You know, you know, who, why are you? Oh, you on track? Oh, you stop now? Oh, this is this is not you, which you showed me. I tell you what, if you want to know if a girl is crazy, <laughs> deranged, <laughs> when you go over a house, see, I always kept paper towels in my car, so it's no problem. So when you go into her house and she got paper towels, make a little spill and take three paper towels to clean it up and everything like just throw it in the garbage. And she said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Three paper towels, that little spill. Leave. <laughs> you know, like, you know, little tests like that, you can buy it out. And then go out to the car and say, here, here's paper towels. It's not mean anything. Paper towels. Yeah. But anyway. But enough about beautiful, beautiful Filipino girls, which I love them all to death, let me tell you. But what I seriously want to talk to you about is that I have been kind of became the ambassador of the United States to people when they want to ask me questions about the United States. Like yesterday, someone asked me, <clears throat> are there a lot of jobs in the United States? I said to her, you know, there are a lot of jobs everywhere if you're willing to look for them. You know, if, 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 if you have the skills to perform them, you can find work. 
I know me personally, whatever I wanted to find a job, I found it. You know, when I wanted two jobs, I found it. I went to school, drove a taxi, and also uh, 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 worked at Ford Motor Company on the assembly line. So the jobs out there, you got me. I would look in the paper and see there was a carpenter. You're looking for carpenter's helper, paying fourteen dollars an hour. I would call that guy and say, "Look, you know, you know, I work a week for ten dollars an hour. If I work out, then the next week you pay me fourteen, and thirty days you give me a raise." They said, "Well, yeah, you work for fourteen. You, you got experience. Yeah, you said who ain't got experience driving in a nail? You know." And the worst thing that happens would be, I at least have a job for a week, you know, but it, most of the time it worked out, but you got to be creative in, 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 in your pursuit of jobs and, and what it is you like to do. You know, um, there was this, um, I'm a freelance publicity photographer. I also photograph models. I, I'm a headhunter. That's, that's, what, that's what I'm known as. I'm known as a headhunter in my business. That means that if I'm walking around and I see you and I say, wow, you got the look, you got the face, you got the good good bone structure, you know, you got beautiful hair. I don't care if you're seven months old or 70 years old. If I think you got it, you got to let me photograph you. And that's what I would do. I would headhunt and I would photograph people and take them to modeling agencies and say, look, look, look. Now, in photographing the modeling agencies, the modeling agencies work on a, let me break it down to you real quick. A person goes into a modeling agency and says, look, I want to be a model. The person sitting behind me says, oh, we can't tell you got to do a test shoot. Oh, test shoot? How much is a test shoot? 250 300 test shoot. You see, okay. You pay the 250 300 to do a test shoot. You do the test shoot, you get the proofs, and you're looking at them, and they say, do I have what it takes? They say, wow. I say, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we can see the potential. But you need some experience in, in knowing how to look into the camera, how to walk, and, and all, and, and how to present yourself, and how to dress. And Okay, well, how do I learn that? You have to take one of our courses. Oh, okay, well, how much is your course? Ah, the course started out at $1,500. $1,500 can range up to $5,000 a course, which one would you want to pay for? No, you pay for the $1,500. So you take the $1,500, you know, classes. And granted, they teach you how to walk. They put books on your head. They teach you how to walk up and down a runway. You get a few more photo shoots. And the biggest thing that happened to you is that when big department stores like Macy's or, or, or uh, you know, you know, um, what a, I can't think of it. I can't think of department stores. Whatever department stores, you know, uh, who cares? Whenever they have their fashion shows, you see, they have fashion shows throughout the year showing off their spring wear, their summer wear, their winter wear, and what have you. They contact the modeling agencies, and modeling agencies may say, well, we need seven models, we need ten models. Uh, you know, so they're not paying. It's an exchange type of thing where, because the agency gets to have their girls who are going to these classes experience themselves in a real life working as a model situation which is good which is good you know and so anyway so uh this is what this is what then after it's over with you say well well okay well that's all you can do good luck bye now those who are chosen then they become the cash cows for the agencies because they want to take them to a different level follow what i'm saying okay so anyway for me to photograph in the modeling agencies I, I used to want to be one of the photographers who they gave they okay look you need a test shoot Paul Gerard, he charges two hundred fifty dollars. He charges two hundred dollars. You know, this is what a test you call, and they call me. They never would, for the simple reason that they did not want me photographing their sweet little precious twelve and fifteen year olds or or uh, eighteen year olds. You know, for fear that I might be pimping them or I might put them on drugs or I may want to have sex with them or or I may do some other type of perverted thing. You know, you know, with them or whatever. So I said, okay. Okay. I got to come creative in how to work for these modeling agencies. So I said, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I'll do. At this time, I'm shooting black and white film. 36, 36 exposures on a roll of film. And I processed and printed my own work. So I said, okay. Look, I'll tell you what. 
I will photograph your girls for $25. And $25 is just to pay for the cost of the film and processing. They said $25. I showed them my portfolio. My portfolio was pretty kick ass. You know, which I don't talk about portfolios in a second. So um, I said, but whatever 8 by 10s they wanted, they had to pay $25 in 8 by 10. So he said, yeah, is that it? I said, yeah. So I uh, charged $25 for the photo shoot and $25 8 by 10. So they said, deal. Because what's their goal? Their goal is to have their girls get experience working with photographers because that's all part of the modeling, the modeling experience. So <clears throat> my being me, I would take a model and since there's 36 frames on a roll, I would shoot six frames and them in one outfit, change them. I would change them about three or four times on that one roll of film. So they got three or four different looks, you know, and what have you. So when the proofs came and they're looking at the proofs, they said, oh, I want this one. I'll take 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 this one. So at $25 an eight by 10, if they end up buying, you know, anywhere from about five to about seven, eight by tens, I'm getting my money. I'm getting my 150, I'm getting my 200, I'm getting my money that, that I would have initially got as just being a photographer. But I had to be creative to be able to get that same amount of money from them, you know, because they weren't gonna, they weren't, you know, they don't wanna take a chance or whatever. And I did location shooting, which is something I'm very good at, I think, doing location shooting. And one thing I'm also very good at as a photographer, is I'm very good working with people who don't have experience in front of the camera. Because God has given me this attribute to be able to make people feel comfortable very quickly in front of me. You know, to, to really bring out them very quickly and, 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 and make them feel like sliced bread and to get the most of them when I take their picture. And that's worked good. That's worked good for me. That's worked fantastic for me. You know, and so that's what I've done and that's what I do. Now, talking about portfolios, photographers, they say that, you know, we can do your portfolio and you know, for $200, we can do a portfolio for you for six or not. We can do your portfolio for $150. Let me stop you. A portfolio is not just pictures. A portfolio is something that shows you over a period of time of how you look through the eyes of different photographers, different assignments, you know, different different uh, 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 jobs you've done. So if anybody tells you or a photographer tells you that he can do your portfolio, he is being dishonest and offering you a disservice. But it's easier. It's easier to say we'll do a portfolio. But for, for me to you, I want to want you to know your portfolio should show you over a, pet, a span of time. It should show your growth. It should show your uh, development. It should show you you being viewed and how you've inspired different photographers. You know, or spec ads. Spec ads. A spec ad would be something like this. You know, now photographing somebody, just pointing a camera and, and photographing them. It can be pretty pressuring, you know. It can be pretty overwhelming, you know. But so, but so, I would do spec ads. I do spec ads like, okay, uh, this is Arma Vienna sausages. I shouldn't show you what I'm eating. It's, it's very bad. <laughs> so, ah, this is Vienna sausages. Would you like to have some? It's, ah, it's so exciting. Ah. You see, now what this does is that it takes the pressure off of the, the model and the model can focus on yeah the sausage is mm, yum yum eat them all up <laughs> you know? like so I would do that I would put um, a coca cola I would put a product I would put something rather be something cleaning or, or whatever I would put a product in their hand to make it appear that they are it's called a spec ad it's an ad that's what it is you're, you're creating an ad with them and you find that you get you know a pretty uh, nice you know um, a lot of Work, work out of the person. Now, also, it's photographing a model. You can photograph a model, but when you <laughs> photograph them over a period of time, not one shoot, two shoot, three shoot, four shoots, when you got comfortable with each other, when you're working with some with someone, but then 
that's um, uh, that's a, that's a blessing. Okay, um, I know. Uh, I, would, I wanted to tell you this. You know, um, a lot of times when I do my video, I smoke a cigarette. What you don't know is that I have this thing, and inside here, there is a little round doodad kind of thing. And as tape, when I put in here, and I mean, take a couple puffs and just drop it in like that. Now, when I move too fast, when you're sitting around these rooms and people are moving too fast, they're smoking cigarettes continuously, and they're putting cigarettes in the ashtray and just watching them burn. Just, it just drive me crazy. It's like, and then after that, you, oh, yo, man, you got a cigarette? Yo, man, you got a cigarette? Man, you just let a whole pack of cigarettes burn in the ashtray. <laughs> so I started putting them out. And you should drive, yo, man, what are you doing? I'm putting out your cigarette. You're not smoking it. You're just burning it. So I became got kind of crazy for that. Like, look at him, he's putting So anyway, but anyway, the reason I'm telling this story, that's when I first met, met the Godfather, so Mr. James Brown. When Bonnie Helton Sweeney, the founder of the pre Grammy party, said, uh, I, I, she asked me to be her photographer at the Howard Hessman's uh, uh, um, We Love Rock and Roll event many years ago in Hollywood. It had The Temptations, uh, it had Chuck Barry, uh, it had uh, Martha Reese and Mandela's, it had Frankie Valley, it had uh, Starship, Jefferson Starship, it had um, uh, um, uh, um, Grace Slick, I had a number of people on the venue and what have you. And um, I remember Chuck Barry real quick. Chuck Barry was supposed to do two two appearances. And so when I met Chuck Barry, you know, I said, uh, uh, I said, how you doing Chuck? He was sitting in a chair, like, he was sitting in a chair like, like this. You know, because I asked him, I asked him if I could take his picture. He was sitting, sitting like this. I said, uh, can I take your picture? He said, I hate this business. I hate this business. And, he, and you know, he said, and he, he said, I'm not going back on. And, you know, I took a couple pictures of him, and he got up and left. You know? <laughs> some of you have seen some of the pictures I've posted from that from that shoot of him doing um, his um, famous you know, guitar walk and also his flip. But he was, he was, he was <laughs> vocalizing what he was thinking about. I met Chuck Berry many years after that. You know, I covered him a couple of times. And he just stripped himself down all the way when he travel, when he go on tour, when he does what he do, he travels with a driver, his handler, and his guitar. That's all he travels with in a car. Just the three of them going down the lonely highway to the next gig. You see, in that next town, there's a hard rock and roll band that beats in that city that knows all Chuck Berry songs. And that's who Chuck Berry gets to back on. He gets the band, call a place and there'll be a band that knows Chuck Berry. Oh, you wanna, you know, um, Play back up for Chuck and Barry. Hell yeah! <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they get the gig. But otherwise than that, no fanfare, no big hoop de la, no big bus. You know, like this is just him, his, his handler, driver, and down the road they go. So, so anyway, so uh, when Bonnie asked me, who was the founder of Pre Grammy Party, um, and we know if there's a heaven up above, she's teaching people how to network. I know I'm making this long, but you know, uh, as Mike Kingsley said, don't make them too long. But there's something else I want to show you. <laughs> but anyway, I keep going on and on. You know, uh, he said, um, um, uh, but, uh, so I said, uh, okay. So uh, I went backstage to Mr. Brown where he was getting dressed. And I said, uh, Mr. Brown, Bonnie asked me, um, uh, has, has, has asked me to take pictures of you. And he said, oh, okay, he put on his boots and blah, 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 like this, like this, <laughs> so I'm taking pictures. I didn't know much about photography. I'm a mediocre photographer, as I've been told by my, my photography instructor, Mr. Nemechek, who told me that um, uh, when I was working, you know, I was working a job, driving a taxi, going to school, and also working a seminar, line. I fell asleep on a, on a larger, he was from Germany. He did brochures around the world. 
And he came in and said, sleep, sleep. I was, because I was on the laundry on the table, which is something. I finished my work, but you never sleep on the laundry. I'm like, just sleep on the laundry. And he comes in, oh, sleep, 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 Gerard. You can always be a mediocre photographer. And that's how, that's how I always label myself as a mediocre photographer. I never read a manual, you know, just, just pushing buttons. Sometimes I push buttons that I can't fix it, and now it's real bad. <laughs> you want my cell phone? I've learned not to fool around my cell phone anymore because, you know, I might hit something up and, and, and ruin everything. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so anyway, so what happened was that um, when, I met, when I met Mr. Brown, he said, never take a picture of me smoking a cigarette. I said, okay, Mr. Brown, I won't do that. He said, never take a break in case you didn't get it. Let me speak slower for those in the Philippines who might be watching this. He said to me, a lot of you don't know who James, Mr. James Brown is, but that's okay. He said, never take a picture of me smoking a cigarette. That always stuck in my mind. So it bothered me when he passed away, when they did an autobiography of him with Mr. Bobbitt. Mr. Bobbitt was his manager, road manager. Mr. Bobbitt was my, con when I got assignment to go photograph him, I would contact Mr. Bobbitt. Mr. Bobbitt would pull me in, you know, into the dressing room or wherever I was. Uh, I looked at Mr. Brown as having three circles around him. There was his inner circle where Reverend Al Sharpton Mr. Bobbitt, the manager, Bonnie would be. And then in his second circle, the second circle was where I would be. You know, some of the other people who he needed in order to him to do what he had to do. And the third circle is you, you know, okay? So that's how I always imagine it, how I explain it. I was like around the second ring around him. So I could call Mr. Bobbitt if Mr. Brown was playing in Manila. I can say, Mr. Bobbitt, um, I have a friend of mine in Manila who want to come by and see the show. Can you put his name on the guest list? He said, sure, Gerard. He said, Gerard, they're going to come? I said, yeah. He said, Gerard, you know they better come. I said, I said okay, Mr. Bobbitt, <laughs> they'll be there. Because Mr. Bobbitt did not like no shows. You know, he, he hated it because he knew that, that, that no show could have gone to somebody because Mr. Bobbitt bought him money. I sent him a big camera, so Mr. Brown autographing it to him. I sent it to him and, and said, Mr. Bobbitt, you know, when Mr. Brown passed away, I said, I said this to you. I said, just send me back the cost of the, my camp. I really sell it to you. I, I can't put a price on it because to me it's priceless. Because it's him shining, uh, autographing a shot I took of him, you know, autographing him. Uh, I shot of him, you know. And so I told him, look, just send me back the cost of what a good meal would, would cost, you know. I have not gotten it, but that's okay. But anyway, so, um, he said, that, but, so when they did the documentary of Mr. Brown, when he passed away, it was beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And lo and behold, in the middle of that thing, they showed a picture of him smoking a cigarette. 